comparison is a lot more complex than one might think, uh, especially since now I've been researching the financial rights of Muslim women under Islam. Uh, but also uh, because of some other factors. For example, those who uh, really followed the change in the economic structure, gender economic structure in the U.S. Uh, came quickly to the conclusion that while the family was supported by one salary, now that women work, you need at least two salaries to go to the same level where one salary supported the family. In other words, capitalism always works, you know, a certain um, balance uh, just to reproduce the workers and, and keep quite the same level of profit. So, uh, women are making money, but as if the family as a whole uh, is making the same. At the same time, in the Muslim world, there are women who are quite rich, and I think maybe that's something you can pull, uh, pull for, um, who have been able to achieve quite a bit of financial security uh, through the dictates of Islamic law, which uh, requires that uh, women in the family must inherit. They have an assigned share in the inheritance regardless, okay? Uh, these are just two uh, very quick observations. Uh, the, the actual set of financial rights for the Muslim women that is not being practiced in the Muslim world, and, and women are not getting at all uh, what they deserve, uh, um, would require a long uh, discussion. For example, uh, the, the Muslim wife is entitled uh, uh, to be compensated for her housework. This is something that the feminist movement in the 60s asked for. It didn't fly at all. 1,500 years ago, you know, and, and later, most of the jurists agreed that Muslim women should be compensated for their housework because as a wife, she is, the, the marriage contract is not a service contract. It's a companionship contract. So that's an additional job. And so on and so forth and so forth. So I, I think by uh, ma making more women understand these rights, we can get to a more equitable uh, situation in the Muslim world. But at the same time, the economy itself is a driver. And, and right now, the economy needs to be developed. And it is booming in some places. It is developing. And in those areas, you will find extremely rich women. I want, to, I want to preserve some gender equity in the questioning here, so I'm going to hear this. I'm the Miranda Dean Atkins, the Miranda Freedom Institute. I have a uh, comment or question on the disconnect we've been talking about. But first, I want to acknowledge the great work of the three panelists that are doing uh, and uh, in the respective areas of expertise. It's wonderful to see many complement each other. But on this disconnect that you talked about, uh, Dalia, um, I have two uh, observations. Uh, first off, when Freedom House does its uh, evaluations, they probably focus on a set of issues that's important to the agenda at Freedom House, which may not necessarily focus on the concerns of the women in a particular Muslim country. And that may be a partial explanation. Another issue, uh, and, and I think you touched on that when you talked about like the security issues for Palestinian women and so on. But another issue, too, is that there's going to be a timeline between what a society holds as the ideal or the correct status of things and when it achieves that. You know, in the United States, I'd say by the late 1960s, we had a pretty good idea of social expectations for civil rights, for equality between the races, and we're not quite there yet. Um, so I think that when we look at Saudi Arabia, the fact that we have higher expectations than the reality matches the fact that the society is moving, however slowly, in the right direction. Whereas in Egypt, as Professor Alibri pointed out, they went through a period of building up expectations, which may have caused some, you know, coincided with social reform, and now the situation has become cloudier again. So that, that's an, just a comment that you might want to comment on. I, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point. Um, first, on the Freedom House uh, report, the, there were, I think, 44 factors in it. Right? They were based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I think you're right. It, in, in, they are taking a specific position, certainly, on um, what are the important things to measure. Um, but they do include security in, in their you know, measurement, and, uh, as well as religious freedom. So, uh, but, but many other things as well. Um, the, the other thing about our uh, that you, you know, 
our expectations going to drive um, realities on the ground to change? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I hope so. Um, in, in some cases, I think in, you know, I think in Egypt there are a lot of explanations for why people's sentiment has kind of gotten actually behind the rights on the ground. Women have actually made tremendous progress in the last, say, 10 years in Egypt in terms of uh, family uh, rights, uh, the right to uh, initiate a divorce, uh, custody, and things like that. Uh, it's been pushed forward mostly by the first lady, I mean, kind of on her own, just pushing forward for many of these improvements in, uh, in women's rights. It hasn't, and I mean, this, I, I, I feel sad to say this, it really has not been um, a grassroots sort of push by a groundswell of women saying, you know, we want these different rights. I think they're appreciated by, by many people. But the, the, the gap, especially the gap between men and women in Egypt, uh, in some cases can be explained by deep economic problems. Um, the unemployment rate among men in Egypt is so high that it's hard for, in some cases, the idea that women should be working just kind of conflicts with the fact that so many men are out of work and are financially responsible for the family and so forth. So I think Egypt is such a complicated issue. Um, but what, what I was saying in, in, the, in the beginning about this lack of a relationship between cultural values and reality on the ground would, I mean, I have to think about it a little bit more, but might lead us to believe that perhaps cultural uh, normative values that doesn't necessarily actually connect to progress or reality on the ground. That in some cases it does, and I mean in some countries, both the the normative values and the reality on the ground is ahead. Um, but in some cases, there's there isn't that relationship. So it seems that it it'll, it's just sort of a uh, case by case. Uh, in some cases it works, and sometimes sometimes there's different dynamics that work. Dalia is of Egyptian heritage, right? And I'm of Lebanese heritage. So at the risk of putting my foot in my mouth, I will comment on Egypt, if you don't mind. And feel free to correct me. But I've followed the case of Egypt for quite a while now. Uh, and I remember there was a push uh, by uh, Egyptian uh, women's rights advocates in the legal field and, and elsewhere uh, in the days of President Sadat. Uh, these women uh, were characterized by more of a secular, westernized approach to change. And in fact, the change they wanted was finally uh, pushed by the First Lady uh, from the top. And so after President uh, Sadat uh, was assassinated, all this was reversed because it did not have a popular backing. My understanding that there was a lesson learned over there and from my discussions with the leaders at Al-Azhar uh, thereafter, that the next set of changes that you're now saying were uh, uh, supported by the First Lady did come from uh, jurists, from Al-Azhar, women advocates who understood the importance of the Islamic jurisprudential underpinning for change in the law, and I actually followed the discussion in the parliament on the Hula law, which you referred to, in which some very, uh, a certain group of uh, Egyptian Muslim uh, parliamentarians thought if you could give the woman the right to divorce, no Muslim family in Egypt would remain intact. Because right. again, everybody would run out the door. This has not happened. Uh, but then there were a whole number of people, parliamentarians and male jurists and so on, who argued in the paper and elsewhere, this is Islamically a solid position. I mentioned Hamad Salim al awwa who is very, you know, he is an Islamist. Uh, so this second generation of changes came through the people as well as being pushed from the top. And therefore, I believe that even if the regime evolves, changes, whatever, that the changes were stick, unlike in the days of Sadat. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, we're, I'm sorry, we're going to have to have one more uh, quick question and then maybe a round of quick comments. Uh, we don't want you to go away. We still have uh, coffee, tea, and dessert on the second floor, so our panelists will be.